Day seven, we'll just repeat a little bit of the introduction with my slide one, Hiroshi. Um, next slide. So when we saw your call uh, with this reference to the plague, we were reminded that many scholars in the 14th century went on to write about the decay and decline of higher education during and immediately after that tragedy. Although new institutions and charters did follow 200 years later. With that in mind, we thought that sharing a five week fragment of the, from the taxonomy of educational objectives that we set ourselves in January at Harvard might trigger a good discussion and discourse on what design is and what design does. At one level, architecture is a discipline of material organization, organization of many orders and many notable shifts in its discourse are connected to technology, including material research. And whilst Corbusier characterized the relationship between the architect and the engineer as a struggle, we know that to the contrary, this alliance often produces precious outcomes. When we trace the history of materials like steel and, and, and concrete, we can see architects are often left behind and out of the loop as numeracy, articulacy, and industrialization drives a new net. Labor divides and regroups in fresh permutations at that moment, leaving designers behind. Jennifer, Nelson, and I were frustrated by observing such a trend in the use of cross-laminated timber and wanted to tackle that by researching for a controlling design idea or ideas and visions through a pedagog pedagogical approach that she will unfold in a moment. Through sponsorship by Swenteren's Trust in Stockholm, we immersed ourselves in Sweden during February where we visited great architecture and ended up in the town of Skellefteå where Martinson's timber factory manufactures CLT timber and other timbers in, in a sustainable fashion. We spent time looking at technique, traditions and capacity of the material to give the studio a good base to begin the work. And at this point, I'm gonna hand over to Jennifer. Hi everyone, uh, Hiroshi, if you can just board now, my first slide. Hi everyone, thanks for joining us this evening. The studio that Hanif and I developed begins with these four conceptual underpinnings. The first questions the emergence of effects in recent architectural history and locates the design project in the American South, while the third and fourth themes challenge the aesthetics of wood and what we are calling CLT blanks. When the Guggenheim Museum opened in Bilbao, Spain in 1997, it produced an instantaneous reaction from around the globe. New packs were formed between cultural institutions, architects, and cities, all vying for their own version of this newly minted uh, shiny museum. Labeled the Bilbao effect, the recipe was as follows. Iconic architecture plus cultural investment could reinvent dying cities. Similarly, the Dubai effect, largely attributed to the rise of gravity-defying towers <coughs> perpetrated during the construction boom of the 2000s, greatly altered Dubai's skyline and became a symbol for free market capitalism. Go to the next slide, I think there's some. In the late 19th century, after the Great Fire, the city of Chicago's rebuilding effort resulted in the first tall building constructed out of structural steel, one third the weight of its masonry counterpart. Steel towers were fast to erect, erect and exceeded fire code, a new type was born. The Chicago effect shifted paradigms. Currently, we see yet another pattern emerging with the architectural and structural advancements of mass timber, specifically in the Scandinavian countries. Much like these other effects, the Scandinavian effect has the potential to travel to other contexts. Throughout the semester, uh, students have designed two projects tackling the programs of a single family house, which we're gonna focus the talk on today, and a mid-rise tower. Here, Mises house and tower are revelatory. The Farnsworth House came first and the Seagram's Tower came after. Yet in the spirit of a shared structural solution seen here in the column detailing of both buildings, we almost forget there's such a significant difference between the height of the two. 
When challenging these two typologies, timber is both a familiar and unfamiliar material. In type five construction in the US, wood translates seamlessly into the single family house, from wood framing on the left to cross laminated timber panels on the right. CLT offers an alternative as two by sixes are now laminated together into large panels instead of framed out at 16 inches on center. Benefits are measurable and include overall reduction of construction time, factory precision of geometry, and now we have houses with solid walls. Constructing mid-rise towers out of wood is counterintuitive, yet parallels the revolutionary thinking uh, of steel construction in the Chicago case. The studio has conceptually positioned CLT as a series of large structural sheets or blanks comprised of three, five, and seven ply laminated timber panels measuring nine feet and 50 feet lengths with endless possibilities for openings, shape, and geometry. These blanks will be used for elevation and interior walls, as well as floor slabs or plates. As elevation and plates are sliced and cut into rooms for a house or multiplied into stacks for a mid-rise tower, CLT blanks becomes a prime material for testing architectural and structural ideas. Additionally, we've asked the students in the studio to make a representational position around the aesthetics of wood. For decades, Europeans have doubled down on soft white wood interiors from grand halls, quaint bedrooms, and accordion corridors to curved surfaces and double height spaces for schools and pavilions. Or we see wood as lifestyle from IKEA's 2015 furniture collection, largely played out in a set of stools, benches, and desks to Sam Jacobs' plank scarf for sale at, at 30 pounds. It seems clear to us the image of wood is on trend. Switching now to art practice, Donald Judd's materials, listed as Douglas fir plywood in the gallery, follows the proportions of standard plywood sheet material while Rachel Wright reads Untitled felt floor are resin felt castings of a 120 year old wood floor, meaning it looks like wood, but it is not wood. Or how Lebanese artist Shokar offers clues for how wood might stack in her 1966 sculpture. And lastly, how Mavis Pousset's abstraction of wood textures offers up possibilities for assembly techniques. As contemporary artists grapple with real and fake imagery of wood, architects absorb the image of wood into contemporary interiors. And we've asked the students to define the aesthetics of wood, both as a representational device, but also a tectonic question. Um, so thank you so much for entertaining the framework of the studio again today. Um, and now I'll hand it over to Hiroshi, uh, who will get the presentations going. Thank you, Hanif and Jennifer, and thank you for the studio this semester. Um, on behalf of everyone, I'd also like to thank the Architecture Foundation for hosting this lecture series, the 100 Day Studio. Um, they're much needed as we all self-quarantine. Um, I'd like to welcome newcomers and remind everyone to mute themselves as we move through the presentations. Um, and the last of the formalities, my name is Hiroshi and I'll be emceeing our session today. Seven students today, Alejandro, Calvin, Edgar, Ariane, Piraya and myself, along with the seven students yesterday, will present our work around cross-laminated timber from the studio Jennifer Bonner just introduced, Mass Timber and the Scandinavian Effect. Our work explores many facets of CLT in the context of Raleigh, North Carolina, and more broadly, the context of architectural discourse around engineered wood. With our program, a large house for 10 people, and our focus on the expression of the CLT blank, we'll see explorations in material extremes, architectural metaphors with cardboard boxes, wood joint tectonics, the industrial off-the-shelf nature of CLT, carbon sequestration, and props. At the end of our seven presentations to get today, we'll have time for questions. Um, we're happy to take questions both as a group and as individuals on our work in the studio and our individual thoughts on the position of CLT in the larger profession. Alejandro will start us off with his take on the extremity of thinness. Thank you. Thank you, Hiroshi. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Alejandro Saldarriaga. I was born and raised in Bogota, Colombia, where I received my architecture degree from the Universidad de Los Andes. Today, I'm going to be presenting my project, which is titled Thick and Thin. The project was born out of my personal interest of challenging tectonic properties of materials. 
I quickly defined the CLT blank as a heavy and unyielding material, which led me to question if mass timber could adopt delicate and fluid properties like those of a wooden peel. A delicate expression in my proposal asked for a minimalistic design. This led me to the concept of a house of two peeled walls. The walls being the primary structure of the house and the peels would distribute all of the interior spaces of the project. Said concept made the structural design of the house central for the proposal for which I arrived to three structural concepts. The first one consisted of curving the structural wall. Understanding that the CLT panel is an optimal material for a structural wall because the cross lamination deals with vertical and shear forces, the introduction of a curve would endow the wall with horizontal stability. This led me to investigate processes of bending a CLT panel. The first is a process in which moisture is introduced CLT panel for the purpose of making the material bend while it dries. And these are some studies made by the architect Akim Menges. The second process is possible by making scores into the cross laminated panel and cutting the layers that work against the curve through a CNC routing file. This makes the possible curvatures highly customizable because they only depend on the distance between the scores, endowing mass customization properties to the curved CLT panel. The second st structural concept of the house is what I'd like to call the dynamic cantilevering slab. A thin slab would question the thickness of the CLT blank but would not work structurally, and the thick slab would work against the concept of delicateness. Therefore, a compromise was achieved that consisted of putting the thick CLT slab through a process of CNC routing to create a slab that continues towards the outside of the structure. An experiment was conducted with a CNC routed plywood panel, and as you can see, the result achieves structural resilience and is able to maximize slab thinness, successfully altering the heavy tectonic properties of the CLT blank. Interestingly enough, because of the routing process, the cross lamination layers of the CLT slab would be revealed and would be imprinted upon the roof of the house. The third and final structural concept was born out of the need of a tertiary system that would take care of the wind loads acting on the house. Therefore, a system of laminated curve veneer which would work in tension in the facade of the building was proposed. The fabrication of said piece consists of gluing layers of veneer and pressing them together under a mold. This is a scale test of the facade, which challenges the traditional appearance of mass timber in architecture. The construction sequence of the house proves that the essence of the project is the consolidation of the three structural concepts, where structural and spatial design are one. As one approaches the house in the suburban landscape, the first elements of the design that are read are the thin slab lines, the alternating curved veneer, and the curtain fabrics. This reduces the visual weight of the house substantially and endows the project with tectonic properties that are not natural to cross laminated timber. The plan emphasizes the diverse spatialities that the peeled wall is able to generate. All of the program can be held inside the system and most importantly, 60% of the vertical continuity of the wall is held at all times. The curved wall and the cantilevering slab render supports architecture, an almost massless house that engages vividly with the exterior. This exploration of delicateness and fluidity poses a counterpoint to the thinking of a CLT house as a massing operation and proposes a new typology for the material. The delicateness of the one wall house is very visible in section. The CNC routed cantilever slab that reveals the cross lamination pattern upon the roof of the house is visible in these drawings. Because of the minimalist expression of the house, the construction of the design is relatively simple and is able to be explained through five architectural details. These two final images serve as a testament to prove that cross laminated timber is a material that can be able to adopt more plastic expressions like that of metal and concrete, making it a resource that can replace all construction materials in the long run, pushing for a more sustainable future in the architecture field. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alejandro. Next up, we move to Cardboard Architecture with Arya and Kaligi. Hello, everyone. My name is Arya Kaligi, and I'm from Tehran, Iran. I'm going to present my project for Mass Timber Studio called Cardboard Architecture, and I will explain it through a theoretical compass that you were introduced by studio instructors dressing CLT blanks, aesthetics of wood, American South, and finally, the Scandinavian effect. 
Starting with silty blanks as a main ingredient of the project, the goal is to produce volumetric mass using large planar sheets of timber. I looked at cardboard boxes since they're doing the same thing by simply unrolling the flat sheets of corrugated cardboard, making the design operations and finally folding them back to produce the mass. This took me to Peter Reisenman's cardboard architecture introduced by him in 1967 and where he's interested in the image of building as cardboard model. And I started with unrolling a typical bedroom, making the design interventions and folding it back to produce the bedroom's mass. And then I used a set of unrolled Home Depot cardboard box to study. Regarding the notion of American South and looking at the suburban houses in North Carolina, there is an interest in a type that expresses multiple parts rather than a monolithic mass as the ideal type for an American family house. So following this massing strategy, I looked at a series of works from German artist, Amy Noble, where he produces unexpected overlaps and compositions using simple primitive shapes. And thinking about the notion of composition in contemporary discourse, I studied kissing architecture by Sylvia Lavin, where John Baldessari in his kissing series embraces the discomfort in composition that is produced by tangential parts. So I regarded each individual room as a part to produce a composition of kissing parts in the plan. Then looking at wood planks by Amy Noble, I enrolled the mass and treated each face of the facade as an independent figure and finally applied the materials and openings onto it. Looking at a tilt-up concrete wall construction as a common American construction technique, I considered employing it in CLT construction and this is a study of the process of tilt-up model making producing the final structure of my model. Now I go briefly through the interior spaces. Here I have a living room and a garage with a small courtyard in the center. These are the bedrooms showing the CLT as the core structure and the corrugated metal cladding as the exterior finish. I have the kitchen and dining room here with an access to swimming pool and terrace. And finally, the master bedroom, the bathroom, and the walk-in closet. I placed the lightweight wood structure on top of a heavy concrete podium, which mediates between the steep slope of the site and the house on top of it. And this is where the house is located within our collective site. Finally, on the notion of aesthetics, there is a mismatch between the openings of the metal cladding and the openings on the CLT core, exposing some of the wood grain to the outside world, as well as some of the exterior cladding to the interior spaces. So back to the studio compass, here is a diagram where I show the area that I focused on in this project. Thank you all for your attention. Thanks, Arya. Next, we'll move on to uh, um, move on to pegboard tectonics with Calvin Boyd. Hello, my name is Calvin. I am an MRC one student from Michigan, and this project titled Step House is fundamentally about a pegboard tectonic. The house is located on plot seven in the middle of our collective site, and as such, is situated on an aggressive incline a 30-foot change in elevation from end to end. Moreover, the road that leads to the site is on the west, meaning that visitors approach from its highest point. Naturally, these site conditions, along with the predetermined gross area of approximately 10,000 square feet, called for a three-story project that gradually stepped down the landscape. However, it was important to me that the house also conceptually retain a one-story appearance. 
Despite the abundance of high-rise apartments, McMansions, and triple-decker housing types that exist across America, I would still argue that the image of the framed, single-story gabled house is the most iconic and easily recognizable symbol for home. Thus, for me, the only question that remained was in what way could CLT further exaggerate and emphasize that symbolism? To arrive at an answer, I first decided to partition my project's massing as follows. A conceptually solid CLT top floor supported by two seemingly transparent levels underneath. The solid came from a series of transformations, primarily mirroring and copying, and contains few openings, sans a skylight on the roof. This partitioning not only allowed for multiple readings of the project, a straightforward single-story residence on approach when looking east, while the familiar volume seemingly floats in all other elevations. It also brought the question of structure front and center. In this project, the role of structure and circulation are not merely pragmatic, they are spatial as well. Here, a central CLT stair functions as structure, circulation, and also as a partition between two families. Moreover, strategic cuts within the stair create a vertical gradient of public to private space. The tectonic logic of the stair is the focal point of this project. CLT stair treads slot and notch into openings within the house's pegboard-like CLT core, and residents are let on to the idea that this oversized amenity stair is actually key to the house's stability. Returning back to the idea of a public to private gradient, the entrance and top floor of the house are the most public spaces and are outfitted for two families, in addition to a back corner guest suite. Here, regular furniture appears petite, so 10 person couches and sprawling tables cover the living and dining areas. It is also important to note that the top floor's perimeter CLT walls are what enables the project's extensive roof span with so few other structural elements in plan. The project's CLT stair core and thinner walls from below help support this main space, but ultimately the top floor is gracefully hung from the aforementioned CLT walls above. The result is a lavish space that fully takes advantage of the project's roof, a series of three tilted gables featuring a large semicircular skylight that frames, lights and frames the stair below. And after descending to the level below, visitors are able to peek into the neighboring apartments through carefully placed slots within the pegboard CLT wall. The apartments are similar in size and programmatic distribution, however their layouts differ based on preferences derived from the individual families. Though neither apartment is completely private, several striated CLT walls in plan obscure views from one end of the house to the other. Finally, the lowest floor houses bedrooms for both families. Each room differs in size and use, but all are granted an uninterrupted floor to ceiling view to the park beyond. Furthermore, Bathrooms line the back wall of this plan, and CLT walls shaped like miniature houses both frame the lowermost stairs and provide additional privacy and visual occlusion. All in all, the house is one that is visually divided in thirds from the exterior, but the project central stair and occupants do not allow the house to do so on the interior. The house is still one that cascades down the landscape in section, but the stair that appears to prop up the entire first floor eclipses that reading resulting in a clear diagram for the building that's less expected and ultimately more dynamic. Thank you. Thank you, Calvin. That was wonderful. And now we'll take a look at piles in the industrial off the shelf with Edgar Rodriguez. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Edgar Rodriguez and I'm from Mexico. And today I will be sharing a little bit about my project, Home, a Pile of CLT. The main interest of this project was to give an architectural form to the inherent properties in CLT. And I'm gonna describe how this affected the aesthetic, spatial, and structural characteristics of the design. So taking the CLT panel as a starting point, it's worth noting that it is black, it's big, flat, structurally sound and customizable. And for this project, I wanted to preserve the aesthetic qualities of the panel as an industrialized product. The CLT blank, as we renamed it in the studio, with its maximum dimensions of 2.7 by 15 meters, is used throughout the design with little transformations. This is one of the initial concept sketches. What I was trying to speculate on was the possibility to create a rich and complex spatial condition by intersecting complete panels. 
This interest resulted in the organization of the program within a regular arrangement of interlocking walls. And this grid would not only allocate rooms for the program, but it also gives rigidity to the structure of the house. This concept was further explored in the fabrication of a scale model where all the pieces interlock or sit in place. This model was essential to the development of detailed drawings of the panels that compose a house. Uh, these are the panels scattered around the plan drawings uh, uh, where all the apertures in the panels measure about 2.44 by 2.10 meters. The result of this panelization is a collection of 57 panels that pile up into a house. Uh, hence, the second part of the title of my project, a pile of CLT. The structural architectural buildup of the house takes the expression of a big pile of off-the-shelf panels of CLT. This aesthetic approach of the pile was not only informing the formal architectonic aspects of the house, I also tried to make a reading of this concept at a programmatic level. At a micro level, the program is a pile of stuff. This image shows the objects inside the house detached from their architectural constraints floating in space. And at a macro level, the program is also a pile of rooms. In this specific case, the traditional suburban house program gets inverted to adapt, to, to adapt the house to a sloping site. The bedrooms are located on the lower level, the common areas at the ground floor and on top a massive gable roof that creates an oversized attic below it. Moreover, uh, this roof stands as a symbol of houseness in, in a similar way in which this painting by Joseph Boyce conveys the image of a house with a rough smudge of black paint. This building turns into a house the moment that the gable roof appears on top. Um, architecturally, as we can see in this section drawing, the roof is also acting as a neutralizer, a big gesture that uniforms and disguises the irregularity of the walls and slabs underneath. Another aspect that I tried to experiment with was the exaggeration of the wood grain pattern in CLT, just given the fact that CLT is built of solid wood, the grain could be used as a graphic ornamentation of the surface. Through a technique called udukuri, which consists of applying coats of colored paint onto a rough surface of wood and then sanding the layers off, this is a possibility. This technique uh, is deployed in the underside of the roof as the only ornamental move of the project. And this also helps to highlight the exceptional condition of the roof within the logic of the rest of the project. In the interior, the CLT is left exposed and the cross lamination is evident in all the openings of the house. This is a view of the dining room on the first floor of the house. And on the lower level, the CLT panels are anchored to the concrete slab foundation, which is polished and used as a final floor surface and window panes just attached to the superstructure as fixtures. Overall, this project is a take on the American suburban house. Uh, the unique collection of walls, slabs, furniture, and other objects makes a home out of a house. Thank you very much. Thank you, fantastic, Edgar. Next up, we'll explore precarious cantilevers with Ian Groskell. Thank you, Hiroshi. My name is Ian Groskell, and I'm from Cincinnati, Ohio. The title of the project is Precarious Cantilever, where the premise is to use the structural and aesthetic qualities of CLT to create a simultaneously separate and unified home. The project, as you've seen in previous presentations, is located in Raleigh, North Carolina. With its southern culture and strong vernacular, this location allowed for some exciting opportunities and combinations to emerge. Zooming in, the site is located on a ridge line with varying degrees of slope. The site of the project is located on Site 9, highlighted, which is one of the steepest sites and inclines the project towards the idea of cantilevering. This is the quarter scale model from the culmination of the project. I wish I could bring the physical model onto Zoom. I think the photo shows the overall effect of the cantilevers, the aesthetic differences, the barren apertures, and the gable roof. If we step back, I wanted to see what typology could be used as the basis for this. Looking to Raleigh, I could turn to opportunities that emerge from the vernacular type of the Charleston single. You notice that it has three distinct parts, terraces, a unified hole, and repeated stacking. The simplified floor plan of the Charleston Single shows a variety of shared spaces at the Primbury Center, 
for a computable floor plan that accommodates distinct programs, but I wanted to discover how CLT could redefine this vernacular and how it could be potentially used to house a multi-generational family as a user type. This would require differentiating space for multiple generations within the constraints of maintaining a unified home. What if using CLT, we could take the basic form of the Charleston single and create something unified with distinct parts. You can see from the GIF that I took the three levels of the Charleston single, separated them to create difference, reunified them at specific points to create connection, and cantilevered them to create a variety of shared spaces. The shared space, as you can see in the plan, occurs on the terraces and along the interior circulation just off of the terrace. The plan for all three levels organizes around the vertical circulation, Towards the back of the plan lies the living quarters of the first generation, and towards the front lies the shared spaces like the large terrace and dining. The shared, space, the shared living area of the second floor lies just off of the vertical circulation, while the private rooms of the second generation lie at either of the ends of the bar to ensure privacy. The cantilever then allows a singular large terrace on the roof of the first floor. As one moves to the third floor, the terraces and rooms become smaller to house the third and youngest generation. Following a similar pattern, the third floor is organized around the core and produces a cantilever on either side of the bar. This rendering depicts the shared space on the third floor where the roof structure, defined by two intersecting gable roofs, allows for angular apertures to light up the space and the vertical circulation. The roof, which can be seen in this GIF, shows the intersection of two gable roofs, while also allowing light to enter and multiple readings to occur. Mixing the black painted wood and the traditional wood treatment combined with the lining and misaligning apertures creates multiple readings of separation and connection while understanding that this is one house. In the section taken at the extremity of the house, we can see the separation clearly. Here, the private rooms of the residents are fully separated, while when one moves towards the center, the bars realign to create a vertically integrated shared space. The elevations show a similar dichotomy between separation and connection. The connection seen in the southern elevation is achieved through the flattening of the facade by painting the cantilevers dark and aligning apertures between floors further flattens and obscures the cantilevers. The multiple terraces on the northern facade, on the other hand, are emphasized with the use of natural wood and separated apertures. The one cantilever that is visible maintains its darker expression. Being as we are in a mass timber studio, CLT is used as a primary material for the house's structure. By orienting the CLT differently for the core and the walls, the house leverages the ability of CLT to span both heights and lengths. To accommodate the three-story unified stairwell, the structure uses two vertically oriented CLT blanks to provide the rigidity needed for the core. The bars of the house use horizontally spanning CLT walls to stabilize the cantilevers. Once each of the walls are in place, the bar volumes can act as a cantilevering agents and further stabilize the otherwise seemingly precarious house. The structure and design techniques allowed for by CLT creates a precariously cantilevered house that can accommodate a variety of generations through a series of shared and private spaces. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Next, we'll contemplate carbon sequestration with Piraya Supasid. Hello, my name is Piraya Sofasit. I'm from Thailand. Today I will be presenting my project, Lasting Timber, which put the topic of CO2 sequestration in discussion with contemporary way of building. What does it mean to be a building today and what are the future values of building stocks? Each second, the world emits 761 ton of carbon. Making a cubic meter of concrete releases 152 kilograms of the substance in a single human bread consists of 0.046 gram of CO2 content. In a year, one tree absorbs about 21 kilograms through the process of photosynthesis. Making soft wood typical to construction industry store approximately one ton of carbon dioxide in a cubic meter volume. Looking at the way in which building have been constructed, the main building material has always been made out of stone. Its massive volume and material quality have long marked a time in which mankind signify its own dominance. What does it mean for us to construct now? In response to the climatic demand and the rapid population growth, would it be possible to pivot away from what we have always known and understood? If column, the most common architectural element have always been constructed out of stone and understood to be massive. The Doric column, the Corinthian column, amongst other, 
Perhaps it is only appropriate that we now erect the same architectural element that would redefine our current town with engineered timber. Unlike its predecessor, the mass timber column may not be very ornated. Its beauty instead is signified by the amount of CO2 sequestered in the process of its making. The column composed of interlocking engineered timber unit, 1.5 by 1.5 meter and over 10 meter high, sequestering over 22.5 tons of CO2 individually. As a reference, I look to the building type called antebellum, a neoclassical type from the American South. Classical wooden column lie the exterior porch with the inner living space located in the center. In my project, the only element touching the ground is the mass timber column, lining the outer limit of the house, each set three meters apart. The first level hangs slightly above grade with a 20 degree difference in orientation from its surrounding structure. The second level is a simple square subdivided into different necessary rooms and spaces. A large skylight cut through the entablature roof with opening penetrating through the interior and exterior spaces. The elevation of the inner volume shows the project straightforward assembly method with full high opening alternates with CRT sheets. The section reveals how the directionality of the inner volume and the outer perimeter intersect. Half of the space is directed by its plan orientation while the other of its roof volume. The intersection of the two systems work to support the house structurally as well as spatially. The exterior element is contracted with solid timber unit while the inner livable space is contracted with sheets of CLT. Built out of the same material, the contraction method contrasts the exterior and the interior. As one slips through the column as a way of entry, one is given a chance to measure oneself against the wooden mass. Being in the in-between space, one is sheltered yet still outside. Large cut through the depth of the entablature gives the light to both interior and exterior spaces. One enters the house through its lower level, slightly lifted from the ground. A full high window frame the exterior column with a twist in the center, putting forward the relationship between the interior and the exterior. Arriving at the second level, one can closely examine how the light CLT contraction meets its massive support. The different axis of the house component can be understood from this corner conditions. Finally, from the second floor bedroom, the 4.5 meter window frames the mass timber column outside, the entablature above and the view beyond. Like the stone predecessor, the mass element will last through time. As one gaze outside and measure oneself against what one sees, perhaps one can start to contemplate how much more massive elements must one build in order to absorb and store enough CO2 to offset the amount that is being released. A quick shift in way we have understood the built environment and what we have demanded of it may be one way of moving forward. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Piraya. Uh, and lastly, I will present my own project on CLT props. <clears throat> Again, my name is Hiroshi Kaneko. I'm in a post-professional architecture degree at the GSD and I'm from Portland, Oregon. This house is based squarely on the fundamental unit of the CLT blank. The blank gives us an interesting new unit to work with. It is planar, is manufactured in standard dimensions, and is finished on a CNC mill. It inverses the fascination we have with steel. It occupies volume in exchange for mass, and it suggests a new kind of plasticity that concrete, once set, struggles to achieve. The CLT blank suggests a paperness, with operative fabrication techniques like cutting, beveling, and what may otherwise be thought of as gluing along the edge though done instead with nails, bolts, and screws, but nevertheless a still a seam-oriented process of assemblage. Its cost advantage lies in this very point. Prefabricated sheets, complete with windows and door frame cutouts, are shipped to site and are situated by crane, bolted, and given a surface finish. In other words, taped, glued, and painted. The intent then is to exploit this paperness and to liberate CLT blank from its blankness. Through a series of cut and fold and prop and glue operations, a house is modeled that both resists the rectangular blankness of the material and is fundamentally tied to it. 
The CLT blank, cut, folded, and propped against itself, reminds one of dance. The program for the house is drawn along these lines. In dance, the human body, our basic unit of existence, is choreographed to extend itself into something more. The sketches of Rudolf Laban, an early pioneer of modern dance, suggest extracorporeal extensions that emerge from the play of movements. The house was chosen to be the Tally Beattie School of Dance and Choreography, taking advantage of the expression suggestive in this art form and the liberation of the bodiness that defines it. The house begins with the propping together of two oversized CLT surfaces. Taking cues from the suburban site in Raleigh, North Carolina, the house takes on elements of Southern typology, the gable and the wraparound porch. The propping of two large surfaces naturally takes on the form of the oversized gable. These gabled surfaces sit atop a porch propped up by cutout paper-like shapes. A series of other paper-like moves define smaller scale Southern typological elements, the oversized chimney stack, the exaggerated front door and the dormer. The cuts and folds create an architecture of prop. One relies on the other. It is a house of cards. Remove one panel and the rest tumble down. The elements are deliberately exaggerated. The architecture becomes a prop for the dancers. It suggests outdoor amphitheaters, wedge spaces to dance into, and massive columnar elements to dance against. CLT inclines itself to the sharp designs of Northern European architecture, or the soft materiality in Japanese architecture. It is no surprise, given the progressive industries in these countries, that CLT has already showcased itself in design innovation and has made its way into the developed fabric. The United States tends to reserve its media coverage of CLT for the biggest, tallest, and fastest. We are a country obsessed in competition towards the extremes. If we had to take the sustainable merits of cross-laminated timber seriously, I suggest, and I'm in good company with my peers this afternoon and yesterday's presentation, that we open up the drive toward the extreme to more aspects of formality than size, height, and speed. CLT's position as a paper product, analogous to our architectural tools of model making, can drive us toward one such new tectonic of wood. Thank you very much. And that concludes our presentations for this evening, this afternoon. Um, we'd like to open up the session to questions. If you have questions on how we approach the CLT wood in the studio or on any specific person's project, please write within the chat box and Ellis, our host, can moderate. Um, thank you, and I'll hand it off to Ellis and everyone else in the studio. Um, see if you can remember people's names. I'm gonna close down the slideshow so that we can be face to face, so to say. French. Thank you, Aaron, you need my video on. Um, thanks everybody, that was um, another set of seven fantastic presentations, all incredibly uh, articulately delivered. Um, I guess if I can open it up with a question, I mean, one of, from a British perspective, from uh, sitting in, in, in London and looking at this work, actually one of the, um, the tensions perhaps, um, is between the the in, environmental impulse that's clearly at play in the studio and the fact that all of the projects we've looked at are ultimately standalone buildings that they're they're either you know villas or super scale villas, but they don't actually suggest any kind of urbanism maybe with the tower project that you're about to come on to that becomes a kind of possibility um so how do you reconcile the 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 impulse towards sustainability that you're you're kind of um, thinking about at a constructional level and you know how that that, that impulse might um might also inform the uh, the arrangement of multiple units can you yeah i think you can all unmute yourselves can't you yeah yeah jennifer do you want to take that i'm gonna let you take it honey Okay. Well, with the, I mean, one of the things is that um, I think one of the students said uh, we were deliberately focused on the USA where there is a lot of land and there are lots of large buildings. Of course, we could transport it back and, and the towers that we are now working on. So, as I said at the beginning, it's a small fragment. You're only seeing five weeks of work here uh, and normally it takes a day to present it. We're currently, uh, as a group, working on mid-rise towers between 70 to 120 meters, and that will be the final project. And in there, there is a lot of material that 
starts to bring together some of the thinking that goes beyond instrument and beyond technology and beyond industry, which is what we're seeing in the UK quite a lot. It still doesn't tackle the issue of fire. I know that our government is just about to make a decision on that. But I do think that as engineers and architects, we should take control of that situation, you know, break the door down. So in a way, um, the, the, the multiplicity of units that will come out of the tower, where there's some have mixed programs, we are hoping that the, at the end, we will have some of those to critique and show. Uh, and the only other thing to add to that is, again, it's a very small piece of what we're doing. We, ha we had planned a very large scale uh, symposium, which was supposed to be last week, will now be on February the 26th for exactly this reason, with a lot of people who are working on housing, a lot of educators, some people from the industry. So we're still hoping to continue this and try and answer some of those questions, which is February the 26th next year now. But hopefully the fire decisions are made and we'll be kind of able to hug timber again. Yeah, and I would question just- Question on urbanism. Uh, yeah, I would just add to what Hanif was saying, not so much a sustainability position, but I think it was important that the student look at the house first, because at that point, they're looking at the scale of domesticity, um, where they can look at joints, the way things slot together and form. As we know, if we would start with the tower, I think we kind of all get into kind of stacking floor plates and become efficient very quickly. And so the idea was that uh, the students would undertake uh, some formal ideas first. Okay, um, and I'm gonna hand over the mic now to Maya Mystery. Uh, oh, Maya, are you there? You've got the, you're, you're unmuted now. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, thanks a lot for sharing your work. It's quite inspirational and it helped a lot. So my uh, question is like, I was uh, doing a research about like, CLT buildings across over the globe. And I found that there are many precedents like in Europe compared to US. So just wanted to know what are the current challenges faced by this industry and why it's not commonly accepted here. And I like found in comments that like building code is currently a big challenge, but uh, I wanted to know your opinion. Okay. If I can just answer the code question while the students are thinking of how to answer the rest. Codes are always five years behind reality. So I, I, I think even in the UK, we're challenging the codes quite a lot. Um, so does anyone else want to speak rather than just me? Yeah, I, I mean, I think there's, a, there's an issue with um, buildability and understanding the, just the material itself. And I think part of the the mission of the studio was to push the agenda of CLT and the material and make it ex as exciting as possible to get um, everyone into the idea of building with it. And then that includes not just architects, um, but the building industry, um, industries that fabricate and produce CLT. Um, because I think right now there are still also limited areas of where the CLT is produced and the, the as a way to reduce carbon footprint, I think it also means um, sourcing CLT locally and getting the building industry very interested in, in manufacturing, producing, and learning how to build this product. Okay, I'm gonna hand over to Seb Sebastian, doctor. Hello, um, can everybody hear me? We can. Hello, Sebastian here from South Africa. Thanks for these wonderful presentations. I really enjoyed that. Um, I'm, I'm just posted my question here on the text box. <clears throat> we, we are seeing a, a lot of beautifully exposed timber surfaces in the presented designs. Um, and my question simply would be, um, what is your experience um, with CLT um, under exposed conditions, the durability of it? Um, we have we have mixed experience with that, and, and and all the work that we are exposed to it's usually covered and fully cladded, and actually not exposed to external conditions like sun, rain, changing humidity, and the lot. Um, is there any new developments out there how you can 
treat it and seal it, that it actually can be fully exposed? Curious to hear experiences here. I will, I will start. Jennifer's got a lot to say because she's built her own house or a house uh, based on some of this. The, the, the durability issue is a big question. And currently, I think there isn't a technique as such. And you just allow for sacrificial layers. We know that even during construction, if you don't cover it, you face the risk of moisture also getting into it. I think there are lots of developments going on that combine the issue of flame spread with the vandalism is the other one. And also how can you develop systems on the outside that still can actually do all the other things current materials do, but take the benefit of the insulation and structural stability of the CLT. So you will be able to, in, in very simple terms, thin down the finish on the outside. Jennifer, do you want to add to that? Sure, the good question, Sebastian. Yeah, you get about, for a three-ply piece of CLT, you get about four uh, R value. Um, so you get about one R value per inch. Um, and so you really need much, much more R value for like a wall assembly or a roof assembly. Um, so what you have to do is add insulation. Um, if you want the uh, CLT exposed on the interior, you obviously put the insulation panel on the exterior with all of your rainproofing and weather barriers. Um, and then you can clad it also with any kind of material. I think what you're seeing in a lot of the students work is an ambition, right? So it's either they are using, like let's say in Hiroshi's project, the last one, they're using CLT as these big large sheets that are uh, glued or, or um, I'm sorry, screwed together, uh, but that the structural panel is intact and that there's an ambition maybe that there's a sacrificial wood layer on the outside just as we would have a, a, um, a rain screen right on normal typical construction uh, so those are a few different ways um, but primarily uh, yeah there's a way of celebrating this material on the interior for sure yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm quite happy to see it in the interior um, that looks great what we saw on exterior applications, we did a few tests um, that the, 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 timber, <coughs> the timber actually starts aging on the, um, under the exposure and the joints open up and you almost get a little bit of warp of every little piece of timber. So it looks very quickly, it, it loses a smooth surface. It almost looks like a slightly aged timber deck with all the joints opening up. So the, the outer layer is obviously structurally lost, which is an easy thing to assume, but it visually changes its characteristics a lot. Okay, um, I'm gonna hand over now to Andre Salazar. Hello everyone, thanks for the presentation. Can you hear me? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, uh, well, I just have one question. Uh, did you find like any constraints or difficulties while designing with CLT planks? Like, I don't know, constraints in height or maybe uh, the form uh, with curves or some things like that? We would like Alejandro to answer that, our student who went first. Yeah, okay. Uh, answering that question, I think uh, the biggest challenge of the CLT is it's because it's an industrialized panel. So we lost him. No, that's good. You still have me? Yeah. 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 So going out of the getting out of the industrialized panel. So as you can see, many of the proposals in this class decided either to go full on with the CLT blank and express it in its most honest way, or half of us decided to try to abstract the industrial properties of the material. And like the, the constraints were, of course, they have specific dimensions and a specific expression. So yeah, I think that was the biggest constraint. Um, okay, well, last up, I think we have Rani uh, Kamel. Um, uh, thank you for the lovely presentations. Um, this is the second session uh, I've been following. I followed yesterday's and today's. Uh, I had a general comment. So um, I noticed that there's a heavy emphasis in the studio on the artistic qualities 
and uh, not the structural possibilities or opportunities that open up using this material. And I remember in the introduction, it was raised that architects are usually left out of material developments. So I started wondering, uh, will the studio pivot as you move into the tower project? And how do you intend to measure the performance of these opportunities? Who wants to pick that up? Have we lost yeah, I, I, I think uh, overall, like there was an interest in like developing uh, an aesthetic sense of working with this material in the house and then to further explore like the structural capabilities in like a larger structure as a tower. Um, it's also part of like the interest of the second um, exercise to go a little bit further in how um, this affects the construction process of a tower and just like the overall speed and efficiency of working with uh, prefabricated uh, systems. Yeah, I don't know if anyone else has some thoughts. It was, uh, it was, I actually appreciated your proposal specifically because I think uh, you were one of the few who actually counted the panels in the yeah. project. <laughs> uh, and, I, <laughs> and, I think, and I think that there's a, there's a kind of uh, clarity uh, in your project when it comes to that because you said this is my building material I can yeah. count it this is the dimension and this is how I've used it yeah yeah I, I think uh, a couple of us like um, did like this um, panelization and also incorporate some like kind of structural understanding of of the panel itself it's but yeah the you're right that the the focus was maybe to develop like an aesthetic or uh, mm -hmm. formal approach first mm -hmm. uh, to be very clear about that uh, to get I, yeah to give like a an architectural just language to, to mm -hmm. the building with uh, CLT to make it different from any other technology yeah I just might add that it's very rare uh, in education that you have a code teacher between a structural engineer and an architect like Hanif and myself and so I I don't see it as they don't have structural solutions because actually every conversation that we've had at Descrits or conversations as a whole, you know, we're, we're constantly going back and forth um, questioning the structure and the design concept, uh, both with Hanif and I. So it's been kind of a luxury to get to rehearse the conversation between structural engineer and architect 14 times throughout the studio with the 14 different projects. And I think we lost Hanif. We, he said his laptop is frozen, so we don't get to we don't get to hear his take on if the structures are working in these houses. Um, thank you, everybody. I am going to first unmute everybody so we can have a round of applause for fantastic presentation. Uh, brilliant. Um, and we have a couple of, um, we have still more to come this week in the 100 Day Studio, uh, 7 to 8 p.m. UK time. Uh, we have Joseph Henry uh, from GLA Regeneration.